Hi, my name is Stephen Norsworthy. I'm here to present to you how spatial position affects piano tuning. The picture on the right shows the eigenmode resonances, we'll talk about what those are, of a Steinway D soundboard. There are six pictures here. The one on the upper left is the eigenmode resonance of 23 hertz, and the one on the lower right is the one from 2900 hertz, and the ones in between are in between frequencies. And what is the significance of this? Well, from the following Journal of Acoustic Society paper called Modeling and Simulation of a Grand Piano from 2013, the authors discovered that there are 450,000 unique eigenmodes of acoustic resonance on a grand piano. So every one of these colors you see on these pictures are the hot and cold spots, the red being the hottest, the blue being the coldest, of the resonances at that particular frequency that's being displayed. And you can see that the low frequency has one hot spot right in the middle, and then when you get up to the higher frequencies, there's thousands of little hot spots all over the piano. These soundboard resonances affect acoustic waves spatially, causing inaccurate measurements in piano tuning. The spectral peaks are tilted just enough from one spatial position to the next to cause small shifts of the peak frequency locations. That's my analysis. After reading this article, I did this experiment. So how did I measure that? How do we measure that? How is it affected in the result of piano tuning? So how do we best measure frequency variation over time? By using a spectrogram. That's the very definition of what a spectrogram is. It measures frequency variation over time because there is no such thing as an instantaneous measure of frequency. Frequency measurements occur over a window of time. The shorter the time measurement window, the faster the measurement result, but with less resolution. An uncertainty principle, a trade-off between speed and resolution. Over a given time window measurement, each spectral component has three parameters, frequency, amplitude, and phase. Observing frequency variation over time during tuning is critical to achieving a good tuning result. This entails sequentially and incrementally taking windows of time blocks and measuring the frequencies or difference frequencies at the output of each time window block from that of the prior time window block. Here is an example. Let's say our time window is 500 milliseconds. That's one half a second. And that means that the data coming in starts at zero time, zero milliseconds. And after 500 milliseconds, we capture enough samples during that window of time and we process that and we look at its spectrum. We slide to the next window overlapping the prior one by 250 milliseconds. So now we're starting the next block at 250 milliseconds. This is from when the hammer strikes. Hammer is striking at zero milliseconds. And so at 250 milliseconds to 750 milliseconds, we still have a 500 millisecond window. At the end of that 750 milliseconds, we capture the sound samples during that window and we process that data, etc. The next block would be at starting at 500 milliseconds. 500 milliseconds later would be at 1000 milliseconds and we get an output block from those samples. Sometimes this is called the overlapping periodogram spectrogram. Now the picture on the right shows an experimental setup with a grand piano, a CLE 308, with two mics and a string sensor. 
Again, over a window of time of measurement, each partial has three parameters, frequency, amplitude, and phase. A mic position over the soundboard affects all three parameters, frequency, amplitude, and phase. And most importantly for tuning, the frequency is affected spatially by causing a spectral tilt induced at the soundboard resonances in the acoustic wave. The position of the string motion sensor on the wire does not affect frequency accuracy, but only affects amplitude and phase. The purpose of this experiment is to show the spectrograms of the partial frequency drifts as observed from each pickup. The mics are, as seen in the photo, the one on the left is positioned over hammer area of E2, and the one on the right is positioned over hammer area of F6. The string motion sensor positioned over the note measured is C5. These three pictures are three spectrograms, respectively. The one on the left is from the string sensor. The picture in the middle is from the left mic. And the picture on the right is from the right mic. Notice that the left and right mics show as much as three cents spread. And in the left mic, we see the spread difference from the first partial to the second partial of about two cents, whereas on the right mic we're seeing a spread difference from the second partial to the first partial of nearly three and a half cents from a plus one cent to a minus two and a half cents. But notice on the string sensor the total spread is far less. The spread from the bottom of the first partial ending at 1500 milliseconds is around minus 0.5 cents and the second partial around 2500 milliseconds is a little more than one and a quarter cents. So notice that the uniformity of the motion of the four partials is also quite significantly different. It's more scattered looking with the mics and more uniform and tight with the string sensor. So there's less spread over time with a sensor measurement. And why is this happening? As we had stated earlier, there are eigenmode soundboard resonance peaks, and they are effectively tilting the spectral peaks as found in the spectral analysis, just enough to cause small shifts of the peak frequency locations. We're going to play the output sounds of these three pickups. It's going to be probably difficult considering this is a YouTube presentation. YouTube does funny things with their processing. It's not linear processing, but maybe you can hear these little differences as you look at the pictures. The windows of the pictures are for four seconds each in duration, but I'm going to play the sound samples for you over the full 10 seconds that I recorded them. So here's the 10 second sound from the sensor. Here is the 10 second sound from the left mic. And lastly, the 10 second sound from the right mic. If you go back and play these and use your imagination, the one on the right mic it definitely has a darker sound, and that's probably an acoustic phenomenon from where it's placed, but it also you can sort of hear that flattening of that first partial after about two or three seconds. You can hear that pitch going down. You can't hear that pitch going down so much on the other two. You can sort of hear the pitch of the second partial going down on the left mic. And interestingly, on the right mic it goes up and then down and then back up. 
and notice then the sound from the sensor, things are much tighter and more uniform, and you can hear that in the sound. In conclusion, I re-show the three spectrograms, the one from the sensor, the left mic, and the right mic. And I have some very interesting conclusions here for you, but before we jump into that, I want to emphasize some questions I've gotten from prior slides about what the y-axis is and its partial frequency changes. I'm not showing the absolute frequencies of the partials. I'm showing the change of the absolute frequencies of the partials from one time block output to the next. So we don't even have a first time block output until the end of 500 milliseconds. So those become our zero reference point with respect to changes. So at the end of 750 milliseconds, we have a new time output block, and hence we have a new set of data coming off that zero reference point. So then we start seeing the spreads, the differences in frequencies from output block to output block in sense. So in earlier presentations, I've emphasized that the time point of reference and tuning is important. Do you want to tune in that early phase after the hammer attack? Notice that in each case here, the spread is minimized until you get further and further out in time. And you get too far out in time after two or three seconds, there's a lot of spread. And so you want to tune in that early phase where the partial spreading is minimized. And, but this presentation was about position point spatially. And that was what I covered about these eigenmode resonances tilting the spectrum. And so if you look at, for example, the extreme case of the right mic, there's a three cent spread between the peak of the second partial and the trough of the first partial. That's a lot of spread. And I don't think you want to be taking a, an exam where the examiner is scoring you because you're two or three cents off of what he's expecting it to be. The recommendations I'm making are to, number one, use a method of least spatial variance, and number two, tune early in less than one second after the hammer attack before partial spread becomes extreme. And a lot of the newer programs have multi-partial averaging. So if you have less total spread, you'll have better, tighter averaging going on. Now, that's a whole different subject. I'm not covering that, except to say that some of you may prefer to emphasize the first partial more, the second partial more, the third partial more. You may want to make that decision. If you have all this data in front of you and you can select how you want to make that averaging, you have more control of the situation. So. I'm advocating that all this data be presented to the piano tuner and the piano tuner be given the advantage of all the data and the choice in how he wants to weight the data, weight the partials. And if there's less total spread with multi-partial averaging, it will calm down the display. It will have less jitter going on. The averaging will be a lot tighter, the partial Variances are much smaller because the variances are smaller and when you average those, the display indicator is a lot slower and a lot tighter. What more can we say here? I tried mixing multiple microphones, a microphone array, up to seven microphones, and I didn't see any appreciable spread narrowing. I just saw different looking pictures every time I would average multiple mics together. So I don't believe that there is a significant difference statistically by doing multi-mic averaging. And a lot of people have commented and have various opinions on hammer noise and how it affects tuning in this first time block coming off the hammer. And I have examined this issue extensively. And what I've done is I've muted all three strings, play the hammer noise, record it, and do spectral analysis on it. And it's a low frequency thump and it lasts maybe 10 or 15 milliseconds. It really isn't an issue, especially if that first time block, you're taking out the first 10 or 15 milliseconds, which you might not even have to do. Lastly, I want to say thank you for watching and listening to this presentation. And you have my email address on the first slide, and I'm happy to take your email questions.